So our last group, we actually do have quite a bit to do in learning about these um, group, but we only have a lect less than a lecture and a half to do it. So we've gotten a little bit behind. You remember that day when I had all the computer problems. It really did affect us. So we'll try to catch up a little bit here. Um, the angiosperms, this is obviously not a typical name for a division, but it is the name that everyone uses for this group, and so we're gonna start with that, but I'll tell you two other more properly constructed scientific names from this. You know angio, it means fox, and you know sperm, it means seed. So these are seeds, these are <laughs> plants where the seeds are enclosed in another structure. So the seeds, in this case, the other structure is gonna be a megasporophyll. So the seeds are not naked. But they're gonna be enclosed, not just born on, but enclosed in a megasporophyll. And that morgosporophyll, when it matures, is going to become something that you know very well, and that is the fruit. It's going to become the fruit that you eat in all of your, in apples and pears and almost all of the vegetables that you eat. Not all vegetables, not celery, but many of the other things. That megasporophyll is what you're eating. We'll come back to that and do it. So what are the more correct names for this group? Well, the more correct names, well, the botanical code of nomenclature, there is a code of nomenclature, suggests that at the division level like this, you name things after a genus that occurs in the division. And so if we do that, we the name that has been chosen for that is magnolia. And so the, the magnolia phyta is another name for this division. You don't see that used that much, but you do sometimes see it once in a while used. The least com that's the least common of the three names. The third possible name for this division is the flowering plants, except we do it in Greek. Antho, phyta. Antho is flower. And phyta, plant, so it's literally flowering plants. I probably am gonna use angiosperm, but I think that your um, lab manual uses anthophyta. So those are the two that you should learn, and anthophyta is probably the more correct one that we should be using. But you know, all people who study these things call them angiosperms. <clears throat> there are all these names because this is a huge group. This is the biggest group that we're gonna do. If you take the systematics next year, we're gonna spend more than half the semester talking about this one division. It's got over 250,000, it's probably close to 350,000, 300,000 plants in it, 300,000 species, so it's just a monstrous division. When there's that many of anything, there is a huge amount of diversity. So almost every characteristic I'm gonna tell you about the anthophyta is gonna be violated in some part of that huge, of this huge division. So we're gonna talk about what are the defining characters for the kind of basal groups, the primitive groups, the most, if we had just a few groups way back in uh, um, 190 million years ago, what kind of characteristics would we have found in the anthophyte at those times? Those are the kind of things we're gonna talk about. And yet, those characteristics have undergone parallel evolution or reversals since then. And so we find other kinds of characteristics in, in this group. So here is a, another characteristic that really typifies this group, and that is the production of flowers, the flowering plants. So we have a flower here. We'll give a definition of a flower in a minute, but we'll see at least a few things about that flower in this case. So we have these kinds of sterile leaves. You know them as sepals and petals. We'll come back to those in a minute, but they're, a, they're attractive and they track pollinators. There's a bee in there picking up pollen. There are male, let me see if I can use a light blue on here that'll, that'll show up. 
So there are male parts on here that are the microsporophylls. Now they don't look anything like leaves, but they are microsporophylls. They look like leaves in some cases, but in this case they don't. There's the microsporophyll. And there are megasporophylls Can you see that okay? There's the megasporophyll. It runs down here, and there's part of it down, <coughs> hidden down in those sterile leaves. And it encloses the ovule. So the ovule is down here, enclosed in the base of that megasporophyll, and that is called the ovary. We'll review that again in a minute. So these are the basic ideas. The bee is there because down at the base of that flower, there's uh, a reward for it. So there's these sterile leaves, sequel to petals, they attract the bee, the bee, but the bee really gets something out of it because down in there there's a nectar being produced, a sweet substance that he's down there eating, sticking his proboscis down into, and in the process, he's <coughs> picking up that pollen on his back and going to go to another flower and transfer it here. Here is the pollen from another flower being transferred to the megasporophyll there. We'll come back and go over all of that again, just an overview at this point. Here are the parts of the, some of the flowers, and we can see again that we have the, the petals and sepals. I'm not going to distinguish between them yet. We will in a minute. And these are the sterile leaves. And in this pea flower, that's basically what we're seeing here. All this stuff is sterile, those sterile leaves. And then down in the inside, of that, we would see this. This is the <coughs> megasporophyll. The ovary which is going to become the fruit. This is actually what I've drawn here. This is actually a young fruit, a very young fruit. And here's a mature fruit. And this is all the pea, pea flower, pea young fruit, etc. Let's look inside that, that young fruit. And if we look inside there, we find I'm just going to call them ovules, even though they're on their way to becoming seeds. Here are the ovules, and here are the seeds. And you can skip that middle diagram here. It just shows the, what, this shows what the flower looks like in the process of going from here to here. Okay, so you got the basic idea. We've got the seeds now, but they're enclosed in another structure. The, enclosed seed plants, and that other structure is a megasporophyll. Doesn't look initially like a megasporophyll. We'll come back to that, talk more about that. If we look at the ovule, we find that it has two integuments. So it's like the neophyte in that. So in all of these, these are ovules in all different groups. There's a lot of different variation in this. And you know that there is a name for every one of these types of ovules. We're not going to learn them. Look at this one group here. There's one, one integument. This is a very large group of the angiosperms. Or they are the sunflowers and their relatives. It's called the, the group is called the acerids. There's a quite a number of families in this, and they, that group has one integument. So this is some of that variation. But the primitive state in the group, the state that evolved, 
along with the evolution of the Nidophyta was two integuments, and so two integuments is, a, is what we're considering the characteristic then, characteristic feature for the angiosperms, and one of the features that unites it with the Nidophyta, presence of two integuments. These are ovules. Here's a flower. Now this diagram actually shows a number of different things which I will tell you about. But let's first of all find the flowers and find the things on here that are not flowers. So these are flowers. The other things look like flowers a little bit, but they're not flowers. This thing here, which is something like a sunflower, it's in that sunflower family, that's actually a flower cluster. It's a cluster of flowers. It's called, the flower cluster is called an inflorescence. An inflorescence. If we want to find the flowers in there, I'm going to switch back to red because we're going to talk about flowers. Each of these little circles in here, those are flowers. Each one of those is a flower. And this thing on the outside, as hard as it is to believe, that is also that flat thing. That's one flower. So in this family, the sunflower family, we have false flowers made up of real flowers. So a sunflower is really not a flower, it's a cluster of flowers. This is magnolia and this is a developing fruit. Let me get another color. This is a young fruit of magnolia. And we'll come back to look at what that structure of the fruit in magnolia is. For right now, you can ignore that. Our more important thing right here is that we've got flowers and flower clusters. So I'm going to draw out the parts of a flower here in just a minute. Now, flowers, like strobili, um, can have different structures. They can bi be bisexual or unisexual. Maybe we should first get a definition of what a flower is. And then after you learn this definition, you can see if it really does smell as sweet, still smells as sweet. It's a really strange definition. Perhaps not very helpful. A flower is, it's a determinate strobilis. So you know what a strobilis is? A determinant means it just stops growing. It produces a definite number of parts and stops. Now Selaginella, you know, the strobilis of Selaginella didn't keep growing forever, but also it didn't have like five parts and stop. Each different strobilis might have, one might have five, one might have 10, one might have 15, right? There could be different numbers of sporophylls in that strobilis. So it's, it's an intermediate kind of stage. Here, there is a definite, each species has a definite number of parts in the flower, and it stops. So that's what a determinate strobilis is. It's a determinate strobilis, and that strobilis has short inner nodes. And it bears both reproductive, those are the microsporophylls and the megasporophylls, and sterile, those are the sepals and the petals, <laughs> leaves, and I'm going to put leaves in quotes because those leaves are modified, sometimes highly modified, for their respective functions. So 
So we've already talked about that a little bit. So there's a really awful definition. Probably will never smell sweet to you after that. A determinate strobilus with short inner nodes that bears both reproductive and sterile leaves modified for their respective functions. And I am not going to ask you to write that on an exam. What we have to do is we have to make more sense of it. And we will be, again, doing that as we go on here. That's the definition of a flower. We also need to consider a plant, because I started this out by saying that uh, we can have plants which have unisexual or bisexual flowers. So let's think about the plants. The plants we know already, like in the Cycadophyta, can be monoecious, which means unisexual. Now it's not strobly, but flowers with both sexes <coughs> on one plant. Or the plants can be dioecious. And that is kind of unisexual flowers with one sex or let me maybe I should say that differently with how do I want to say that um, I was going to say one sex on each type of plant but I want to say with the female and male <coughs> flowers on different plants. Now, for those of you with an organized mind, you notice there's another possibility. Not only could you have unisexual flowers, but you could have bisexual flowers. What are the plants when they have not unisexual flowers on them, but when the flowers are bisexual? They are perfect. A perfect plant, perfect where it refers to the plant is a plant with bisexual that is a stroke it's going to be a strobilus bisexual flowers so with another way of saying that is it has a strobilus which has both the male and the female parts on it so that first flower that we looked at remember I drew the male parts and I drew the female parts or I highlighted them on there so that plant we would say is perfect the plant that has that flower on it. It's a bisexual flower on a perfect plant. So that gives rise to the very old and venerable saying that I just made up, man is a imperfect flower. <coughs> Secondary growth occurs in these organisms. We know all the parts of this, so we can do it pretty fast. Near the outside, there is a cork cambium. Produces the bark. There is a vascular cambium that produces on the outside the phloem, the secondary phloem. And on the inside, the secondary xylem. And if we count the secondary xylem here, we can see this is about one, two, three, four years old, four years old stem. Here is a young stem. This is a herbaceous stem. So not only do we have woody, plants here, but we have herbs, so all the grasses, for instance, are 
members of the angiosperms, but many other plants too, coleus for instance. Um, so there can be herbaceous plants. Without secondary growth, it's hard to find a good color for this diagram. Let me try this. This is a vascular bundle. Can't really see that, can you? Not much better. <coughs> vascular bundle. We look in that, we see the xylem here. This is primary xylem. This is the phloem here. And these are fibers. Fibers are a type of sclerenchyma. So our main point here is that we have plants with xylem and phloem only that's primary. It comes from the apical meristem. That's the main point here. So herbaceous plants and woody plants. There's a huge variety in the types of stems that we find. We'll be looking at these in lab more. So here is a kind of stem that runs along the ground. They're called stolons or runners. Very typical of strawberries. If you've ever grown strawberries or you go on the field, you'll see those stems coming out and they will root at the nodes to produce new plants. There are things like this. This is ginger. You can now find ginger in just about every grocery store. Go look at one. And when you look at the ginger, you will see that there are, these are their rhizomes. So they're underground stems. They're not roots. Rhizome is a stem. And notice this growth pattern. It's sympodial growth. So the rhizome provides some storage material for the growth of the plant, which is why we can eat ginger, because it's got some nutrients in there for us and lots of cool extra secondary compounds that gives us the nice ginger flavor. And um, it also provides a way of it. It's vegetative growth. It continues to grow. Here we have a potato. A potato is a stem. It's an underground stem. It's not a root. And we can see that because the eyes of the potato, there's the eye or the bud. Look at that, the bud. It is a bud. If we look at a potato, you would see there is a little eyebrow on it. And in the axle of that eyebrow, there's a little bud. So there's the bud and there's the subtending scaly. So there's an axle that we, and that bud then grows out to produce the new potato plants from that. Now they treat the potatoes in the store so it's hard to get them to grow, but leave it long enough in your refrigerator and you'll notice stems start to come out of it. So you can go do your experiments now, get ready for Thanksgiving, get buy those potatoes now, let them germinate, at least one of them, germinate in your refrigerator. There are all, lots of other types of stems, modified stems. This is um, crocus. You know those plants that come up first thing in the <coughs> spring. Um, when the snow is still out, this is onion. In crocus, we have an enlarged stem. It's kind of right at, grows right at ground level, sometimes even above ground level. If we looked at the outside of that stem, we would see that these little red things, these are scale leaves, They're co they cover this stem. So there are scale leaves on it. So there are nodes and inner nodes on it. So it's a very fleshy stem that has um, storage material for it. These are not edible in this case, but that's because not, they have a lot of starch in them, but they've got a lot of other stuff that isn't good for us. You do an onion. When you cut an onion for Thanksgiving, we're getting ready for that Thanksgiving feast now. Think about all of your onion dissections you're going to do. Cut it lengthwise. Don't cut it crosswise, cut it lengthwise. And you will look down here, and there is the stem. You'll see that little bit that holds those flat things that are in the onion. This is the stem. There's the apical bud. Sometimes you can even find that. And so what are those things? These things, these are leaves. So the juicy oniony part of an onion are modified leaves. 
And when you start peeling apart, it'll make perfect sense of that. Huge variation in the leaves themselves in angiosperms. So first of all, let's remember ourselves, that remember ourselves, yes, when we have a stem and we have a leaf born on that stem, we know it's a leaf because in the axle of the leaf there is an axillary body. And if we look in the axle of these things, there, there is no axillary body. <coughs> That's how we know that this is a leaflet. That is not, it's not a leaf, but it is a part of a leaf. So this leaf is then called a compound leaf. And specific, this leaf, it looks like a feather, so that is a pinnate leaf or pinnately compound. Pinnately compound. Look over this one, we, again we have the stem. Usually you put a T in stem. And now we have a compound leaf, but it looks like a, it looks like a hand. So it is called palmate leaf. Palmately usually starts with a P. I'll just continue for the heck of it. Compound. A pinnately compound leaf. So two types of compound leaves. Alternatively, we can have a simple leaf. There's two types of simple leaves here. There's no division of the leaf blade. This is the blade of the leaf. This is the little stem. In Greek, that's petiole. So the little stem, there's petioles on at least this compound leaf over here too. On the pinnately compound leaf, the petiole is so small that it's <coughs> essentially not there. So in our simple leaf, we have the petiole and the blade. This last leaf over here, this is a leaf of a, a monocot, a different group of the angiosperms. Like still, it's got a blade, but now not shown. If we come down here, it's got a sheath. So there's a sheath at the base of the blade, and that sheath clasps the stem. So if this is the stem, you've got that leaf coming out. I need a hand here at my elbow to do this, but just imagine that there's something that stands out there. There's the sheath, and it clasps here, and then when my fingers are coming off, the leaf blade would come off there. So there's actually a piece of the leaf that clasps around the stem, and that's very typical of this group, the monocots. Think of a grass. You know, if you've ever peeled leaves off of a grass, there's part of that leaf that goes down the stem. That's the sheath, very pronounced in the grasses. I didn't prepare you for this. We're really out of time. These, you can look at these with your glasses on, uh, on your computer. These are the typical disc-shaped chloroplasts that you learned about in introductory biology. You learn that the disc-shaped chloroplasts are what plants have because that's what they have here in the angiosperms. Every plant has this. There's not really any significant variation in this within the angiosperms. Um, this is the photosynthetic tissue, which is called the palisade or spongy mesophyll in the leaf. But what you're looking at there are the chloroplasts. So we'll stop there and talk about roots next time. OK, we're going to do our best to finish up the angiosperms today, the anthophyta. Let's go on and we ended up with the roots and there is a great deal of variability in roots of the anthophyta like there is a great deal of variability in everything but roots are less studied and they're much harder to study and so there aren't really de there aren't defining characteristics so to speak that we know of from the roots and so we're not going to spend a lot of time on it we are going to say that there are two main types of root systems that we find in the 
angiosperms or the anthophyta, and one is represented in this diagram, and this is a taproot system. Now, the <clears throat> taproot system has a central root and branch roots. And it's contrasted with, and next to the, di the second diagram there doesn't show this, the second diagram just shows root hairs. Mm -hmm. So it shows this part enlarged. The second type of root system, and I'll get another color so that's really clear, it's a second type, is called a fibrous root system. And the fibrous root system, if this is the ground, The stem comes down to the ground, and then at the ground level, it branches. So there is no one central root. So highly branched root system, no central root. Single central. And so this kind of root system is typical of grasses. And it's why grasses hold soil so well. So if you go down to the beach and you see along the four dunes, the dunes that are right, the first big dune that's next to the beach, it's called the four dunes, and they always say stay off those dunes, don't walk on those, and you should not walk on those dunes <clears throat> because those dunes are stabilized there, they're in that place because of the grasses that are growing on there, it's one species of grass, sea oats, that is very well adapted to growing in those areas. It's a very pretty grass. Those are native grasses, by the way, the sea oats is. It goes all up and down the coast. And it's got a very big fibrous root system. Sometimes when the waves cut it away, you can see the root system there. And so it holds the sand and those dunes in place. And walking on it will disturb those root systems and then will cause, cause blow throughs. And that's a problem when big waves come, storms come, and they then, then come can break through those dunes and cause damage behind them. So especially in areas where there's houses, uh, you want to be very careful about walking on the dunes, which is why we've got all those over, over walks. So that's all about fibrous root systems and the fragility of those. Now we would like to, at this stage, have you draw an ovule and then check your ovule <coughs> against a drawing and then put that away and like using the white paper method, draw an ovule again and check that against the drawing and we just don't have time to do that in class. So you've got the pictures here. You can print those pages, right, and go do that at home and follow that procedure. Remember, you draw it out from a blank sheet of paper. <coughs> Once you've drawn it out, you check your answer against a correct drawing or a correct photograph from your book. You've got plenty of those now. You correct it in another color, you correct it on there, and then you put that all away. If you got it all right, if it's 100% right, you can stop there. If it's not 100% you're right, you do it again, exactly the same procedure, and you continue that until you get it 100% right. It's a very, very effective method of studying. Continue with that as you're studying for the final exam on all the material, not just on drawing an ovule, and you will do very well. We are going to draw flower structure. So let's think now think about the different parts of the flower and how they're organized. And we're going to start at the very bottom of the flower with a little portion of the stem, which I'm drawing in a very funny shape here, but the shape doesn't matter. We're just going to try to indicate. So this is all going to be a very, very stylized flower, and this little bit of stem drawn in green at the base is also stylized. So that's the stem where all the different flower parts are going to be attached, and it is called the receptacle. On the receptacle, I'm going to work upwards now, we have some green members attached. I mean, they really are green in the 
flower. And these are the sepals. And they provide a protective function. When the flower is in bud, the sepals are closed up around the rest of the flower bud. They are the outer part of the flower bud, and they protect the rest of the flower bud. Now, because this is the angiosperms, and there's a few hundred thousand of them, there's a lot of variation in those sepals. Some, of, some plants do not have sepals, but we're just drawing the kind of the generalized case here of a flower, not trying to represent all the variability, which is really impossible. Above the sepals, you have the big showy parts of the flower, the parts that we find so attractive usually and that insects also attract, find attractive. And I'm gonna draw them very large. And these are the petals. Just gonna write petal up there and petal over here, one petal on each side. So these are the attractive, colorful parts of the flower second parts upwards born on the receptacle. Above those, we come to the male parts of the flower. We'll use blue for those here. And they look like a lot like the sporophores of the Nidophyta, but they're not. These are actually sporophylls. And so this is the male part. Now the male part, in general, we're gonna have a name for that. We're gonna, well, let me see. I'm gonna back up a second. Each of these is called a stamen. And a stamen has two parts. It has this long <coughs> filamentous part, which not coincidentally is called the filament. I'm actually gonna write that on the other side leave some room in the center. So the long part is fine, the filament. And then this top part where the microsporangia are born is called the anther. A-N-T-H-E-R, the anther. And these are microsporophylls. So remember our definition of the flower, it was about having, it was about having modified leaves, modified for the respective functions. And you see that already. Sepals modified for protection, petals modified, modified leaves for attraction, stamen, modified leaves, modified here to bear the microsporophylls. Mod modified the to bear the microsporangia. They are microsporophylls modified to bear the sporangia. And at the very center, we have the female part of the flower. And again, these are just really generalizations of what these things look like. We'll see some variability in a minute. So there's the female part. Now, <clears throat> the female part is a little complex. To understand it, we need, we need some new terminology. First of all, before we can really understand the terminology for the female part, we want to back up a minute and talk about the sepals, the petals, and the stamens and some alternative terminology for them. So let's go back to the sepals and say each of these is a sepal. So each one is a sepal. And if we take all the sepals together, it is called the calyx. So that only is there a individual name for each part, but there is a collective name for all of the parts of that type. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go up the flower now and look at the collective names for all the parts. And when, when we get to the female part, we're gonna use the collective name for that. That's what we're gonna, that's the main thing we're gonna call the female part. And I'll explain why as we go on. So the sepals are called the calyx. The petals, all taken together, are the corolla, the crown. Corolla means crown. So all the petals taken together are called 
the crown. On the male side, all of the stamen taken together are called the house of the man. So the male house. And that is all of the stamen, the andresium. Andros is man. And as you remember, esium, like from ecology, the same root, house. You remember ecology, the study of home. Andresium, the house of the man. Now, the female part. The main term we're going to use for the female part is going to be the house of the woman. So this whole part in the center is the gynesium. Gyno woman or gyne woman. Okay, so the gynesium. Now the gynesium is composed of parts, just like the andresium is composed of parts. But on the gynesial side, they're often very fused together. And so we'll dissect it as we go along, and we'll see those parts. There are also regions, I don't really say parts, but there are regions of this gynesium. And let's name those regions. You can see that there's this top region, which I've drawn here kind of flat. There's this middle region, which is kind of like the filament, it's filamentous, but it's thicker. And then there's this bottom region, which is gonna contain the ovules. In fact, I'm gonna, let's me draw in an ovule here. Right now, I'm gonna draw it on the side. I'll draw a few ovules here, color them in. So there's an ovule. And so this place that contains the ovules is the ovary. So the bottom of that structure is the ovary. The middle part, that long part, is the style. And the top part, this is where the pollen is going to land, is the stigma. You remember stigma, it's one of those early terms we did, and we did clamidomonas, almost one of the first ones we learned. And you remember what it means? Spot. spot. This is the spot, the spot where the pollen lands. <coughs> and that's really the whole thing. I'm drawing it to the side, but you understand the stigma is that whole top thing. <coughs> the top. So those are the basic parts of the flower. We've got to understand gynesium a little more, and there's a couple other terms we may talk about a bit more. So here is a basic dicot flower. There are two great groups of angiosperms, the dicots, so the dicotyledons and the monocotyledons, and you probably know those from introductory biology and you should know them from high school. <clears throat> the dicotyledons have, I'm not going to list all their characteristics, you'll get them in lab, but the flower parts in fives. And so if we looked and we could count in there that we would see the flower parts are in fives. This is hibiscus, by the way, it's a tropical flower, but we do find it as a house plant sometimes in, this, in our um, I think it's a Y, hibiscus. Okay, let's find our parts. Here are the sepals. At the base, you can see there's, they're green. I hope you can see they're green. Here are the petals, bright and showy. The andresium is modified in this case, as is the gynesium, but here's the andresium. The filaments are fused together and you can see the stamen up there. So let's just label andresium first. And then here are the stamen, are the anthers. 
And now at the top, we have five stigmas. The style actually runs down through, there's a, there's a tube made up of the filaments, and the style runs down through that. And then the ovary is down here, enclosed in the petals and the sepals. I, I haven't told you about the word anther, have I yet? I wanted to say a word about anther. <clears throat> Remember the name of these plants, anthophyta. It's the same root as anther. It means flower. And so you also see that the anther is for the male part of the flower. You know what this means. It's an indication that men are inherently superior to female, and it's been in, it has been in, immortalized in the names of these flower parts. Just remember that. The real reason is probably not quite so flattering to old, the older scientists. It is probably sexism. Um, but there you go. This is a monocot. The flower parts are in threes. And now we can see in some of the monocots, oh, by the way, this is crocus, one of the earliest flowers that comes up in the spring. <clears throat> In some of the monocots, you can't tell the sepals from the petals. They look like just like each other. There are, in fact, outside here, there's an outer world of members. Here's one, you can see that, two, three, which would be sepals. And then on the inside, there is one, two, three, which would be petals. But in this case, in crocus, the petals and the sepals are indistinguishable. except by position. And they are called, in that case, when they're indistinguishable, they're not called sepals and, people, sepals and petals, they are called tepals. Tepals. So tepals are just sepals and petals when you can't tell them apart. So we have six tepals in this case, flower pots in threes. You can't tell them apart, but you can tell them apart by position, or only by position, let's just say. The male side of the flower, let's see if I can use a different color here. That seems to be okay. Here is the, uh, the stamen. And in this case, the filament is not like the filaments before. The filament is almost leaf-like, well, a little more leaf-like here. Here's the um, anthers. The filament is extended above the anthers, so this is where the pollen is in these two areas. And I'm not even going to label the filament here because it's unusual. It's an unusual shape. So there's a lot of variation in what the stamen and the anther would look like. <laughs> On the female side, we find Again, stigmas, styles, the styles are partially branched, they're branched above and fused below. And again, the ovary would be down in this region. Now, 
enclosed in the tepals. So just some very minor variation we've seen now, these two flower, two types of flowers. Yes. Lots more variation within the flowers of the angiosperms. We'll actually see a little bit more as we get on and look more at the female part of the flower. We have a good deal more to do about understanding the structure of the female side. This is a fruit. It's the fruit of um, lilac. And what I want to show you is <clears throat> the female part of the flower. So the fruit is the mature ovary, and it contains <clears throat> seeds. So we can look at this fruit to help us understand the structure of the female part, the gynesium. So essentially, the fruit is a developed gynesium. Now, usually the stigma and the style are not present in the fruit. I'd say as a general rule, they're not present. But in this case, they are. Here's the stigma. And this thing here, that's the style. And so you can see each of those parts of the fruit has a stigma and a style. Each of these spaces here, this is a little space, so it's a locule. And if we count them, we can see there's one, two, three, four, five. So it's a dicot. Look at the structure of the bottom below the style. That would be the part of the ovary. It's now the fruit, but it was the ovary originally. And you can see it looks kind of like a leaf. Look at the each of those things is like a leaf that's rolled around. And if the ovules were born on the margins of those leaves and they're rolled around, the ovules then and the seeds would be and were before they were shed in this region. So those are the ovules or where they were, or the seeds. Let's say seeds. That's not quite right. Mature ovules, you, want, you really want to say develop, they developed from the ovules. They developed from the ovules. So each of those portions, then, is a megasporophyll. <clears throat> but in the ovary, when they were younger, at the time of fertilization, they were all fused together. You couldn't tell they were separate like that. So we're looking at them later in the fruit because they've separated out. And you can see now in this fruit that there are megasporophylls. It's very helpful for us to see that. Now, of course, because this is the angiosperms, and many people are specialists in the angiosperms, or even in certain groups of the angiosperms, there's a word for this. There's a special term for megasporophyll in this group. They are megasporophylls, but they are called carpals. Or a carpal would be singular, so a carpal. So the carpal then is a megasporophyll, and there are five carpals in this flower, in this fruit. There are also five locules. The locules are the spaces <clears throat> that are enclosed by those carpals. those folded over carpels. Okay, so that's the most important thing to understand here about the angiosperms. We said the angiosperms, the box seed plants, the anth anthophyta, um, the megasporophylls are folded around and they enclose the seeds in the locules. 
Here is the fruit of another plant. This is a tropical plant. It's actually very young fruits. That was one flower, and it's now in fruit, or now in young fruit. And it's a very unusual plant because you can see the megasporophylls. It's very unusual to see this. Here is a particularly good one. So here's a megasporophyll or a carpal. And there's the ovule in the process of becoming a seed. So you can see exactly what I was saying. It's a leaf-like organ, the carpal is, and then in this case, they were all fused together. They won't fold it around. They were just fused on their margins. You can see that here. They were fused on their margins when they were in flower. And now as it's developed into fruits, they, the individual carpels have split apart. Okay, so the carpel is the megasporophyll. Let's look at this again in some drawings. This is a pea flower. Here are the petals. Here are the sepals. The petals are highly modified in peas, but we're not going to go into details of that now. The gynecium would be down in the center. So the gynecium would be in there, and here it is removed, the gynecium. One carpal, in this case, that's a typical of this pea family, it has one carpal. So here is the stigma, the style, and the ovary. And remember, they're megasporophylls, so they're folded over on each other. So if we were to look at a young one, here's a young developing fruit, a young developing pea pod, we see on the inside ovules. It's the ovary developing into a fruit. And then here is a more mature fruit of a pea. And we would see then the ovules on the inside, which would now be the seeds. More flowers. We want to find our parts on them again. We start from the outside. We have the sepals. The petals. The andresium, so I'm going to label a stamen. And the stamen has two parts. It's got the anther and the filament. And let's get on to the female part, which is what we wanted to look at. And the female part, I'm just going to highlight it here, and then say, look down here, we can see the three parts that I drew. They're actually our flowers. It looks something like the one I drew with the stigma, the style, and the ovary. 
and that is then the gynecium. And in this case, it is composed of fused carpels. There's actually more than one carpel in there, and they're fused. We're going to see that in the next drawing. So now we're just going to look at the female part. We've just labeled all the different parts of the flower. We're going to take a flower similar to the ones we just saw. We're going to take a cross section through this lower part of the flower, through the ovary. And that's what we're going to look at up there. I'm going to use some different colors now. Well, first let me label the ovules. I'll use this orange, whatever color that looks like to you, color for the ovules. Let's take the highlighter and shade in the three locules. So this would probably be a monocot flower. So there are three locules. Just label two of them, but there are three locules in yellow. And if you look closely, I'll grab another color I haven't used. You can see that there are three. Can you see that color? Three carpels. Remegasporophylls. We're always going to try to call them carpels. I'm just keep making this association for you right now, but in general we call them carpels in the anthophyta. So we've got three carpels there. You just can't tell from the outside that there are that many carpels in there. You actually have to cut a cross section. And when you're identifying plants, you will sometimes come to a place an identification guide where it asks how many carpels are there and you have to get out your knife and you have to make a cut through the ovary to find out because you can't see from the outside. Sometimes you can count the number of stigmas. If the stigmas are separate, uh, there's almost always the case that the number of stigmas are the number of carpels. But they're not always separate. One more example. We're doing the exact, essentially the same thing this time. We're going to take our a section through the ovary. There's some extra structures in this flower. We're not going to talk about them. And we're going to look at that section down here. And again, we find one, two, three, three carpels. There, are, in this case, are lots of ovules. All these little blips off the side are an ovule. And now there's a new structure, which I'm just going to mention briefly because it has relevance to Thanksgiving dinner. Well, sort of. Maybe to your sandwich. Uh, I need a color again. And that's these here. These little bits of structure there that are coming out <clears throat> and bear the ovules. So there's an elaborate structure, an elaborate, a larger structure here, which is produced in the locule, the locule's the space, and it allows for the production of additional ovules. So there's more ovules in there. That structure that I've highlighted is the placenta. And you see immediately what that means. Tomatoes. Those juicy, delicious tomatoes. Cut those open. What is that you're eating? Little tomatoes. Yes, it is. It is the placenta. So, here we have the attachment, a uh, slide about the attachment of the ovules. You know, you're going to eat turkey, so what's a placenta from a, a tomato? <laughs> I 
attachment of ovules. And you see that the attachment of the ovules, it varies tremendously. This isn't even the whole variation within the amphiphyta, but this is some of it. We're not gonna learn all that variation. We're gonna segregate it out into some very simple cases. There's a case down here in this corner. There's a case up here in this corner. And there's a case, well, it depends on how you define it, but let's just say we'll just include all of those in this case. So if you look at this, let's start in the lower left corner. There's the central axis, that red dot of the that's the central axis of the septa there. Oh, by the way, these things are called septa, these division planes is called a septa, these fence. So the fences that separate the locules. So those, the central axis of those septa is then in that red dot. The ovules are born on that central axis like this. And so this is called axial placentation. So again, there's the word placenta, the place where the young organism is born. Axial placentation, it's born on the axis. Up here, we see there are no axes. No axes there. There's no one, only one locule. And so the ovules are born on the margins. So this is called marginal. Actually, all of those things are called marginal. Placentation. Almost all the plants, tomato has this, almost all the plants that you know have this. We'll see lots of examples in lab. Pumpkin has marginal placentation. If you remember, if you ever open a pumpkin, right, it's got a big hollow space in the middle and all the seeds are around the sides. If you had a small pumpkin, sometimes you can actually see how they're attached, but in those really big, gigantic, ginormous pumpkins, you don't, you don't see that too well. Last type is you notice in the center here, the ovules are attached on the axis, but there's no, there's no septa. This is called free central placentation. And we'll have a, one example of that in lab. Make sure you look at it. There's a primula has that free central placentation. So there's no attachment of the ovules to the side at all, You're just off the center. Lots of other times, lots and lots of other variations. Those are the ones we're gonna do 